Hey everyone, welcome into the Fantasy Pros Dynasty Football Podcast presented by Reality Sports Online. My name is Kyle Yates and I am your host and I am joined as always by Ray Garvin. Ray, how's it going, man? Yates, it's Monday. Happy Monday, brother. Happy Monday. Good to, good to talk to you. Good to be here. Good to talk to the good people. Uh, appreciate you, man. I don't know what it is in my brain right now, but if you had told me that if you had just said right here, like it's Thursday, I would have been like, yeah, it's Thursday. 100%. Let's go. I would have just been completely committed. I don't know. I don't know if I had a long weekend. I don't know where my head's at, but I mean, you could have totally just said that it was Wednesday or Thursday and I would have believed you. It's just been that kind yeah, of week man. already. Yeah, man. I feel you, bro. I feel you, brother. All right. Uh, you can find Ray on Twitter at Ray GQ. That's Q-U-E. And I can be found on Twitter as well at Kyle Y NFL. We've got some news on tap for tonight that we're going to break through, uh, break down from a dynasty perspective. We've got 2021 rookie sleepers, some guys that we think you should be paying attention to as we move into officially draft season, right? As we look at the NFL draft upcoming and then getting ready for our dynasty rookie drafts, taking a look at some guys that are flying under the radar and then a listener mailbag. We've got a ton of questions that we're going to try to rip through. But before we get into all that, we are giving away a signed Justin Herbert full-size Chargers helmet, courtesy of our friends at pristineauction.com. Entering the contest is super easy. Just complete these simple steps. One, head to Apple Podcasts or CastBox and leave an honest review. Any feedback, guys, positive or negative, is really, really appreciated. And number two, fill out the short form at fantasypros.com slash dynasty contest and submit a screenshot of your review to be entered. But again, head over to fantasypros.com slash dynasty contest for more information. All right, Ray, some news items here. The Chicago Bears have reportedly prioritized making a run at Russell Wilson. I just wanted to mention this, man, because I'm saying <laughs> if the Bears do trade for Russell Wilson, I will be the most obnoxious person <laughs> in the world. You will not be able to deal with me. I'm just throwing it out there and just saying if this does happen, don't say that I didn't warn you. Uh, Zach Ertz could potentially be traded in the coming days. I just want to throw this to you really quick, Ray. Any optimism for Ertz's dynasty stock if he does end up, let's just say, in Indianapolis with reuniting with Carson Wentz? Yeah, I think he, I think he becomes a, a solid veteran value. Nobody that I'm going to prioritize, but if you can get Zach Ertz, you, it's it's just like the stock market, man. You 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 buy the rumor, sell the news. So if there is any any opportunity for Ertz to regain any type of value, you can get him for dirt cheap right now. It's worth a shot, man. Yeah, super cheap, but you know, don't go overpaying. No. But I am at least on board with going out and acquiring him wherever I can because I think that you can get him super, super cheap. And again, not as someone who I would love to have as my tight end one on no. my dynasty roster. If I can have him as a depth piece, I'm I'm uh, I'm on board with that. Uh, Eagles owner Jeffrey Lurie is instructing the team to prioritize Jalen Hurts as the starter going into next season. Now. I still don't think that this discounts or takes quarterback off the board at number six overall if Zach Wilson falls to them at number six overall if Justin Fields is there. I think they're going to have a very, very tough time you know, passing on one of those guys, but all indications at this point are saying that they're not going to be players in free agency. They're going to move forward with trying to build the roster around Jalen Hurts. So, Ray, does this move the needle at all for you? We talked about Jalen Hurts in our Dynasty quarterback rankings episode that we did a couple back. If you're looking for where our rankings are on Jalen Hurts, you, of course, can go back and listen to that. But does this move the needle for you at all on Jalen Hurts' Dynasty stock, or is this kind of just what we expected and we're going to keep you know, uh, keep things as the way that they are? I believe I had Hurts at quarterback 13. It doesn't move the needle, but it solidifies the needle for me. And I, and I do sure. think, honestly – uh, quarterback was never a thought for me personally. I just never thought that that was going to be a possibility for Philly. Um, I mean, when they took Jalen Hurts in the second round, it, it seemed like they were he, – he started four games, man. He started four games at the end of the season. Uh, give him a shot. You know, I think what this does is it locks him in for 2021. And if you're a contending team, we saw his fantasy production with limited opportunity with, with starters. He had no offensive line, no wide receiver help. I think it is a foregone conclusion. I'm just calling my shot here. They are going to draft Jamar Chase if Penny Sewell is not on the board. They're going to surround Hurts with as many weapons as possible, and they're going to try to see what he can do. And I think that's a good move for Philly, to be honest with you. 
yeah, we'll see what happens as we move throughout the offseason. But as of right now, it does look like they're moving forward with Hertz in 2021. And then finally, this broke just before we started recording here tonight. Dak Prescott, come on down and get your money. Dak Prescott signed a contract extension four years, $160 million. Woo, now, I didn't know this. For, I, Yates, I did. I'm in Dallas. You I, didn't know I, this? I, I want to yell, but my boys are right next door and I can't do it. But I did not see that. I literally just got home. You man. didn't I, see this? Yates, I did not see it. Like, I literally put my arms up in jubilation because here and that, I just <laughs> drove from downtown Dallas. I would have pulled over and danced with my pants down had I known this happened. <laughs> but no, I did not know this. This is this is breaking news for me. I did not know this. This is awesome. Yeah, this broke just before we started recording. So yeah, Deck Prescott signed a four-year, $160 million extension. If you're mm. looking for a breakdown of what all this uh, entails, you can find the breakdown of this and all the other information on our Fantasy News app. You can download this on the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store. Uh, our news desk does a just phenomenal job of gathering this information. There are much more of a breakdown there, but it is a ton of money up front as far mm-hmm. as his guarantee. It is a ridiculous contract. So really, really happy for Dak. This is something that we kind of expected. Uh, We talked about this on our quarterback rankings podcast saying that, you know, we expect Dak Prescott to be in Dallas and at least for the next season, whether under the franchise tag or whatever. Nope. He's going to be in Dallas for the foreseeable future. Great news for CD lamb, Amari Cooper, Michael Gallup, uh, of course, the running backs there and then the tight ends that you and I both like here. So Dak Prescott, quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys for the foreseeable future. And Ray just found out. Yes. All right. 2021 rook- rookie sleepers here. So we haven't broken down like our official rankings yet, Ray. We haven't gone in depth on these guys as far as who uh, the you know overall running back rankings for us and wide receivers. People have a gr- yep pretty good idea of who the top guys are, but I thought it would be beneficial for us to sit down and go through some of the guys that towards the bottom of this class, as far as ADP or public perception, however we want to classify it and at least put the spotlight on them for a little bit, because the guys that you can hit in your third round, your fourth round of rookie drafts can absolutely make a difference for your dynasty roster. So wanted to take a look at these guys. We're going to go from five to one and one being like our top sleeper, the guy that we're super, super excited about uh, heading into this rookie class. So Ray, I'll throw it to you here at number five in your 2021 rookie sleepers. Who are we talking about? Yeah, I've got the uh, UNT, the University of North Texas blur, Jaden Jalen Darden, the small wide receiver, uh, just explosive, fast, big time playmaker. I know he played at a small school at UNT Conference USA, but there was a quote from Jamar Chase of LSU, you know, probably the number one wide receiver off the board in the draft. Uh, during an interview, they asked Chase who's been the most impressive player that he's seen throughout the workouts, and his response was Jalen Darden. So I think he's a player who's probably going to be a day three pick, probably early day three pick, and somebody that you know most of your league mates aren't thinking about. And Jalen Darden, that speed, uh, that versatility, that explosiveness, that playmaker and ability is somebody that, you know, hey, he's well worth a shot. Did I, like, write down this entire blurb, like, somewhere, and you, like, copied it and just read it as it was your because this is literally everything that i was going to say as my number five guy was jalen darden i was going to mention the interview on the move the sticks podcast with oh. daniel jeremiah and jamar chase talking about jay i'm a big fan of darden and i put this out when i was going through his tape and i said that and i said that jalen darden is everything that people want tutu atwell to be mm. as far as with tutu People are like enamored with him talking about him in like the first round, second round. I don't see it, man. I just don't see that that side. I know, right? That like lateral mobility. There's none of that there. Now he can be a touch, you know, behind the a uh, touch pass guy behind the line of scrimmage. You put him in motion. He's fast, of course, when he builds up momentum. But Jalen Darden is explosive. He's shifty, good hands can be a guy that you can get the ball to in space, let him create. Now, I don't think that he's going to be someone who can go over the middle of the field and make those contested catches in tight windows, but I don't think it's one of those things like you got to catch him first. So I think Darden has the ability to stretch the field from the slot as well, being a guy who you can utilize out wide on posts, crossers, deep crossers, but that slot fades. Like He just has a ton of versatility 
and what he can bring to an offense. Uh, really, really exciting player. I think that he's going to end up going higher in the NFL draft than people think. Mm. And I want to at least, you know, you said day three pick. I'd probably, again, that was something that I was going to say. So, But, again, like someone I think that can go in the fourth round yep. of the NFL draft and end up making an impact right away. So yeah. love the call here, obviously. Had him as my number five guy, too. Jalen Darden, wide receiver out of North Texas. All right, let's go back to you here for number four. And uh, I'm telling you, if you're reading like my notes or somewhere like that, don't take my guy here at number four. I'm just warning I, you right I now. Don't, I don't have your notes, but a player that I really like is an athletic tight end out of Ole Miss. And it just seems like Ole Miss just has skill position players for days, right? But I'm talking about right. Kenny Eboa, uh, six foot four, 245 pound athletic tight end. He was uh, all SEC third team this past season. He was on the John Mackey Award uh, watch list as one of the nation's top tight ends. And he's just an athletic playmaker, man. We've seen these these athletic freaks out of Ole Miss like DK Metcalf, A.J. Brown, Elijah Moore is there, Dawson Knox, and now Kenny Yeboah transferring from Mississippi State. Uh, I just like his talent, man. And, and when you're talking about the tight end position, you're going to miss out on Pitts at the top and Fryermuth and Jordan. So who are some of those later round tight ends and no one's really talking about Kenny Yeboah and he's got tons of upside tons of athletic ability and he's a player that in the later rounds of your rookie drafts I'm talking late round three early round four heck I was even getting him in round five in a couple of mocks that I've done he's definitely worth the he's definitely worth that cost because of the upside now I haven't watched Yeboah yet he's on my radar he's on my list of guys to watch at the tight end position so I'm good I'm glad to hear that you are a fan that you think that he can absolutely make an impact at the next level. I think that he's someone that I have put like a little star next to his name, you know, before it, because I've heard other people hyping him up. So we're looking for those guys in the third, fourth round that we can take at the tight end position and we can just stash, right? Those yeah. guys that we can just let sit at the bottom of our roster, let them acclimate to the NFL level. If they turn out to be something down the road, then great. If they don't, you know, it's a third, fourth round pick. It doesn't really matter. So, but I do like that you're mentioning him here because I do think from what I've heard, from what I've seen in the limited, op, you know, uh, opportunities is that you does have the talent to make an impact at the NFL level. I'm going to go. And real quick, he was ahead. actually, he was actually at temple. I, I had the colors, the Mississippi state colors and um, the temple colors mixed up, but he was at temple before transferring to Ole Miss. The colors, can we talk about this really quick? The colors <laughs> in the college football game and what they do from, in my mind from a scouting perspective mess oh, with boy. me so much. UCF, yeah. Wake Forest, oh, uh, Vanderbilt, those three schools, there's another one in there that I'm forgetting. Those three schools with those color schemes, I get them confused all yes. the time. I have no idea who plays at what school. You, I can tell you the players. I just can't tell you which one of those three schools that they play at. The only ones we know are Oregon, right? Highlighter yellow, that's Oregon. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Otherwise, it's just a crap shit. Yeah. Uh, okay, so my number four guy, my sleeper in this class, I'm going to take a look at Jonathan Adams Jr., the wide receiver out of Arkansas, Arkansas State. Uh, 6'3", 220 pounds has some of the best highlight reel catches in this entire class. For everything that you see Devontae Smith do, Jamar Chase, of course, uh, I mean, Jalen Waddle has some jaw-dropping catch. No, like Jonathan Adams, put him up there with some of these highlight reel catches. He's a big physical presence. Limited route tree, he was lethal <laughs> against the competition that he played on go routes, on nine routes. They just said, just go, you know, just yep. literally just go <laughs> and we'll huck it up to you. And it worked. So why not just continue to do it? Needs development at that and in, in the route running and the route tree that he's asked to do. But good athlete for his size, able to get out of his stance really quickly, accelerate off the uh, physical, you know, can excel off release off the line of scrimmage. Excellent deep ball tracking ability can go up and high point the football against anyone with his size. Excellent vert. I think he's going to just you know, at his pro day. I think he's going to put up jaw dropping numbers here in the vertical and stuff like that. So really, really physical, big body presence. Now, my only qualification here and thing I was watching him and I was getting Hakeem Butler vibes. Right. Mm -hmm. And I was a big fan of Butler. I loved what he was do what he was able to do. But the NFL obviously didn't. And now Butler is being converted to a tight end in Philadelphia. So. I just don't know how the NFL is going to value this guy, but from a talent perspective, big, big fan. He's flying completely under the radar. There are very few people talking about Jonathan Adams Jr., but I did want to mention him because I think he has the talent to make an impact. Now it's all going to come down to what is the draft capital? What does he get? What What's the landing spot that's going to dictate where exactly we take him in drafts? But if I'm sitting here right now 
I'm willing to take him as a late third, you know, early fourth round pick in rookie drafts because I think he can can make an impact at the next level. Yeah, I like that. Now, I, I there are more and more people starting to sort of talk about Jonathan Adams, and I think he. You're talking about sleepers here. We're not telling. We're not telling the listeners these are players you go out there and take in the the top half of your rookie draft. These are sleepers, and I think Jonathan Adams fits the mold of of a sleeper pick. So I I really really like that one, Yates. So uh, my my third pick, I'm uh, my third guy uh, at number three. I'm gonna stick with the wide receiver position, and I'm gonna go to a player who was highly touted coming out of high school, Nico Collins, the wide receiver out yeah. of Michigan. And listen, let, let me just tell you something. Michigan is like the black hole where high-level recruits just go to die. I mean, it's just under, under Jim Harbaugh, it has not been what Michigan fans thought that he would bring to the table. And Nico Collins is no exception to that. So his freshman season didn't do much. But back-to-back seasons, and I know this sounds gross. I know it doesn't sound good. But he had over 630 yards in back-to-back seasons on 37 receptions and 36 receptions. I mean, that's crazy. Like the the, the yardage he was putting up in limited opportunity at six foot three, six four, 215 pounds, 200 pounds. He's got that prototypical size to be an, 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 an athletic alpha wide receiver at the next level. At the senior bowl, they said he was one of the most impressive players at the senior bowl. Now, when throwing him the ball, if you have not seen Shea Patterson or Joe Milton or Wilton Spate or John O'Corn throw the ball, be thankful because none of them are any good. <laughs> and that's who Nico Collins was catching passes from. So players like this, you have to, they're like a, a, a clay mold. You have to think about if they hit the right landing spot, right? If they get in the right system, he has the physical ability and the tools to develop into something. And he's the perfect late round, stash him on your taxi squad and just let him marinade and develop and, and 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 bake a little bit longer and you could have something special in your hands with Nico Collins. So while you were talking about Collins, I went back and pulled up my summer scouting notes on Collins and from this past year, right when I sat down to scout start scouting the 2021 class. Literally in my summer player notes, I have need to see Collins with a different quarterback before <laughs> I assign a final evaluation because uh, another note horrific quarterback play particularly <laughs> downfield never even gave his wide receivers a chance like no. so then need to see Collins with a different quarterback and then he opted out this yeah. season and <laughs> I didn't get that opportunity so Collins is just a huge question mark for me because the talent the pedigree you mentioned at five star like it's all there for Nico Collins to make an impact at the NFL level but I just don't know what version of him I'm getting now I'll go right. back and I'll watch the senior bowl and but that's <laughs> I don't want to put too much weight on the senior bowl, right? Like right. I don't want to put a ton into that. I want to emphasize the tape. Well, then the tape just leaves a ton of question marks because he can't even be hit when he's wide open deep downfield yeah. because his quarterback just sails the ball on him, right? So, yeah, I I like the call because Collins absolutely could turn into something. Now, my, my question is where exactly is he valued, right? Because yeah. I don't think that he is truly a sleeper because people – I mean, he is, but, yeah, I don't think that – he's going to go in the back end of the third or fourth round or if he's in the same class as a Jonathan Adams, right? Because people know who Nico Collins is because mm. of his recruiting background, because of the platform that he played on at Michigan. So a lot of people know about him, but yet I just don't know where exactly he's going to go in rookie drafts right now because I don't know what his ADP is. What's the consensus? Because yeah. he does have the background, but yet he does have all these question marks. Yeah, I don't. That's a. I mean, that's fair, right? I I think if I were just throwing it out there right now, based on some things that I've seen, it looks like he's going to be a late third, early fourth round pick in rookie drafts. Just and all of this is subject to change as we get closer to the actual as as we hit the NFL draft and see the draft capital. But um, yeah, I, I I get it, man. We, it and that's why some of these guys, you're just I mean, you're literally just taking the talent and. You're crossing your fingers and hoping he lands with the right. Pittsburgh Steelers, you know, who right. routinely develops wide receivers. It's it's one of those things. I don't feel as confident that Nico Collins is going to become something, but if if there is a player who can, you know, realize that potential, I do believe Nico Collins has that ability. 
I agree. Uh, for me, number three, I'm going to talk about Larry Roundtree, running back out of Missouri. I came away impressed with his tape. Now, I don't think that he is going to attract the same level of attention or buzz as the top guys in this class, but I believe that he's going to be a mid-round steal for an NFL team. Smooth runner out in space. Uh, has really good burst and acceleration. Uh, can be extremely effective in a downhill running scheme, no-nonsense runner, uh, great short area quickness and acceleration ability. Was really, really impressed with him. And then uh, does have is a natural receiver as well. So I think that he's not going to be a guy who can step in and be a workhorse back, right? He's, he's a sleeper for a reason. But yet I did come away really impressed with his tape and someone who I'm at least putting – the spotlight on, I'm putting an asterisk next to his name because I'm really, really interested to see where the draft capital is for him. But the talent is there to be a significant contributor as a part of a rotational backfielder or something like that. I came away with round tree, uh, impressed with Roundtree. Yeah, and, and what I like about what he was able to do, and I know this was a long time ago, but he also was a really, really good kick returner as a true freshman at Missouri. And what I say is I'm always looking for players in Dynasty – I want players who have an opportunity to get an opportunity. And a player like Larry Roundtree, he's going to have to make you know a name for himself on special teams, whether that's on kickoff, kick return. And the fact that he did show an ability to return kicks, maybe that's what gives him the slight edge to get on the field yeah. and make that 53. So um, not a bad call. Not as impressed with him as a runner. You know, the sort of decline his junior and senior season. And I know the senior season was shortened. But we're talking about sleepers here, and the fact that he does bring the return game to his element, I really, really like that, man. Yeah, yeah, I love that you mentioned that. As far as bringing that to the table, that's something that I didn't have in my uh, you know, player card here for Larry Roundtree as far as the, the kick return. So, yeah, you mentioned it. That is the ability to make an impact, right? Yep. If you have that in your repertoire, you can be someone who can make an impact and get at least stay on a depth chart. And, again, I'm not saying that he's going to be a guy who an NFL team is going to give him the keys to the kingdom, but a depth piece, a rotational backfield, and if the starter goes down in front of him, I think he has the talent to at least capitalize on that opportunity. Listen, if the slug Jamal Williams can return kicks, Larry Roundtree can return <laughs> kicks. So I, I, I don't hate the call at all. But listen, if I'm going to miss, Kyle, if I'm going to miss on one of these sleepers, damn it, I'm going to miss fast. And there's nobody, not one yep. single player in this 2021 class or probably the 2020 class faster than Anthony Schwartz. I mean, literally world-class speed. I mean, as a, as a, as a high schooler, he set world youth records in the 100-meter dash, like almost sub-10 seconds in the 100-meter dash, almost sub-20 seconds in the 200. I mean, that is that is Olympic speed. He, he really, and I'm not just saying this, he could be an Olympic sprinter. That's how fast Anthony Schwartz is. And playing on, the theme of this show is bad college quarterbacks, which, Yates, I know you've seen a lot <laughs> of it. And Bo Nix, is he's, he's not Michigan bad, but he's not very good either. But catching passes from Bo Nix uh, just didn't go super well for Anthony Schwartz. But uh, when he gets the ball in his hands, man, that the speed is just, it is it's mesmerizing. And he has that. And the NFL, We've seen year after year, they are suckers for speed, and Anthony Schwartz is, has no shortage of that. So as my as my second player on this list, I, I am very much interested in him, and I do believe as time goes on, the sleeper status of Anthony Schwartz will definitely wear off once some of the pro day numbers come in and you know the, the speed zealots start to take a hold of him. But right now, where we stand, if you're in any kind of dynasty startups right now, Anthony Schwartz is a player that I'd be targeting pretty late and just saying, you know what, he's fast, but we'll see what we can do with him. And that's really what it boils down to. Yeah, at the top of my player notes here for Anthony Schwartz, I've got Schwartz is a big play waiting to happen on the football field due to his long speed. I mean, you talk about speed for days. Yeah. You mentioned if you're going to miss, you're going to miss fast. I think that he he doesn't have elite burst or agility. He's more of a player that wins with momentum. So I think you're going to have to rely on some scheme touches, get him out in space. But once he is out in space, good night, you're not catching yeah. him. Like it's he's taking it to the house. Yeah. So. He's someone who I'm re I was really impressed with as far as the role that he's going to be asked to fill. I don't think that he's a well-rounded receiver. I think that he definitely has some things to work on and refinement at the next level. But for a offensive coordinator that wants that big explosive play, the chunk plays who can get him out in space, I think that Schwartz is a perfect option there. And again, we're talking about sleepers. We're talking about these guys who are flying under the radar. 
as a third or fourth round pick, I think that he's got the talent to be able to be someone that I'm willing to take the shot on. Yeah. Uh, for me at number two, I'm really interested to see what you think of this player because there seems to be a divide on Ramondre Stevenson, the running back out of mm-hmm. Oklahoma. Six foot, listed at 246 <laughs> pounds, comes to the senior bowl, weighs in at 227 pounds. So now I already have a question of, okay, what did you play? What What's your film at? Were you just like grossly overlisted? Or <laughs> did you actually play at 246 and now you came into the senior bowl at 227? Regardless, I really like Ramondre Stevenson's film. I came away really, really impressed. I think that he carries his weight extremely well, great body control, able to, uh, I mean, it's evident in his spin moves too. Like you can just see it where he carries his weight extremely well. Doesn't have the extra gear that some of the other running backs that would move him up into this top tier for me. Like when he gets to the open field, he's not pulling away from anyone, but he consistently reached the second level on tape. And when you, Oklahoma used him on both stretches and outside zones and stuff like that, but then also lining up in pistol, pulling guards. And when he was behind those pulling guards, he was excellent. I saw fantastic vision. Now he did miss some holes here or there. He went kind of off on his own. So again, he's a little bit of a project, only 165 total carries in college. So still a little bit of a project, someone that I think, requires some development. I don't think that you're going to plug him in immediately and he's going to start for an NFL team and be a 250 touch guy or anything like that. But I do think that he has the ability to come in, get early day three capital in the NFL draft, then develop. And when he gets the opportunity, I think he's going to take advantage of it because I was a big, big fan. So I'm interested because again, I mentioned it, there is a divide here on Stevenson. So some people see him as like this plotting back. I didn't see that, but I'm interested to see What's your thoughts here on Stevenson? Oh, Yates. Oh, okay. You can you can okay. disagree with me. Tell okay. me. Okay, okay. So here's my thing. If he gets early day three draft capital, I will reevaluate. Where I stand today, I, I, I think he's like a fifth round pick. Fifth round pick, sixth round pick. When, when I watched him on tape, what I saw was versus third stringers versus South Dakota, he ripped off some big runs. Versus a porous Kansas defense, he ripped off some big runs. On those stretch, stretch zone plays versus Baylor, I am seeing him getting beaten to the outside by outside linebackers versus Baylor, which for me does not bode well for what he's going to do at the next level. If he's going north and south, I'm okay with him. East and west is not his game. I think he has exceptional footwork. I do. For for a larger back, Yeah. I think he has exceptional footwork. I just wish that he had the burst and the athleticism to accompany his feet. I don't think Travis Etienne has has really good footwork, personally. That's just me. I, I, I Same see, here. I, Same but here. But Etienne is very, very fast, and he's explosive. I think Ramondre Stevenson has better footwork than Travis Etienne, but his lack of burst and ability if, – if you're getting – Hawk down versus Baylor outside linebackers when that's Isaiah Simmons on the outside, when you're having to deal with Levante David, when you're having to deal with Jalen Smith, I just, I struggle to see how successful he can be for fantasy. I think he's going to be a good depth piece in the NFL, but for fantasy, I I just, if he gets early, early, I mean, fourth round, I will reevaluate, but anything after that, I am pretty much out. I've got him ranked outside of my top 12 running backs right now, but I like his feet. So it's interesting because I think if an NFL team does deploy him as the same style as a Raheem Moster and these guys that we've seen succeed in Kyle Shanahan's outside zone scheme, if they were deploying him like that, I don't think they got their head on right. I don't think that that's what his game is, but plays with a very low pad level, low center of gravity, able to break, uh, tackles easily embrace contact and just keep his feet moving and it's interesting too because you mentioned three games that you watched there those are not the three games that i watched Mm. i watched oklahoma state in 2020 texas tech in 2020 and florida in 2020 Uh, so really interested to see i'm gonna go back let's do this let's go back and let's each watch some of these games right you go back and watch oklahoma state texas tech florida and then i'll go back and i'll try to find the tape on uh you said baylor uh, did you say kansas 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 and south dakota yeah those are 2019 20 baylor's 2020 and the other two are 2019 
Okay, I'll go watch that Baylor one from 2020 because I'm really interested to see what his what his tape looks like in there. But I came away impressed with okay. the games that I watched: Oklahoma State, Texas Tech, and Florida. Hey, this, so that'll be a guy that I'm really interested to see what you think. This is a learning thing, man, and and I think yeah. a lot of people should like do this, right? You challenge me, hey, go back and check out what I saw. I'll go back and look at what you saw, and then let's reconvene. And that's what this that's what this is about. Because I don't know what there may have been. I may have just watched the wrong games, right? And just watch them on bad days or, or whatever the case yep. may be. But this is what this process is, is geared to do. And as you, the listener, hear this, you hear one side of the coin, you hear the other side of the coin. Now you go back and check it out for yourself and see what you, you know, it's not about me being right or Yates being right. We're just giving you what our opinions. Now you take that information and go back and do your own due diligence. Absolutely. I, yeah, and this is, one of the things with scouting and why scouting is just so hit or miss is because for us as talent evaluators in our own right here from a fantasy football perspective and stuff like this, like the games matter. The games that you're watching yeah. can be drastically different depending on, okay, was the starting offensive lineman that, you know, is just a mauler. Was he out that game? And that makes a difference, you know, but then also scouting the traits and trying to take this stuff away. Like it could have just been, he was hampered by an injury and it wasn't reported or different things like this, all trying to get as many games as you can. Well, that's the issue here with 2020 is that we don't have all the games yeah. from these guys. Like some guys, Nico Collins, we just finished talking about, it. he didn't play in 2020. So there's just so many things that are missing from the talent evaluation standpoint this year that is going to make some drastic hits and some drastic misses this year. But there's a guy that you've got here up at number one who I am a fan of as well. And I think that if all things go his way, I think he could be one of those drastic hits. Let's talk about Elijah Mitchell. Mm, Yates, this is my James Robinson of 2021. I love Elijah Mitchell. I love him. I mean... You know, production from his, you know, limited production as a freshman, but as a sophomore over nine, almost a thousand yards rushing. He had almost 350 yards receiving, comes back in his junior season, almost 1200 rushing yards, you know, another 10 receptions. And then this past season in 10 games, he almost hit that 900 rushing yard mark, 16 receptions while sharing the backfield with Trey Rogas. So uh, listen, at five foot 11, 215, 220 pounds, he can do it all. He's a three-down threat. He can run between the tackles. He's got smooth feet. He's not a blazer, right? I, I Probably, what, a high 4-5 guy, low 4-6 in the 40-yard yeah, dash. Yeah, if that, yeah. If, yeah, but he can do it all. And I, I just think his game is predicated. He An NFL team is going to fall in love with Elijah Mitchell. I think he's going to be a day three pick, you know, round four. If he can get that round four draft capital, round five. I think he's going to make a team as a backup. He's going to have to show show well on special teams. But he's a player that I think, if given the opportunity, his game just screams NFL contributor. And not saying he's going to be some star, or some top 12 you know, running back right off the bat, but I do like his game quite a bit. Yeah, again, I you know I keep going back to my player notes, and for me, Elijah Mitchell. Mitchell's not the flashiest running back prospect in this class, but he's very productive in his opportunities. He thrives on running downhill and building up ahead of steam. Would be excellent in a downhill running scheme. I think that uh, he just produces with yep. his opportunity, and he elusive in in tight windows, uh, surprising top end speed for a player of his size too. That was something that stood out to me. Uh, willing to punish a defender that meets him in the hole too. Excellent power. Really, really well rounded running back. And again, I don't think that he. We talk about Travis Etienne and his speed. Like that's one of the things that we can. Ha- uh, Javante Williams and his contact balance. Najee Harris and is. I mean, he's well rounded on a whole other level than Elijah Mitchell, right? But. So there's not that one trait that we can look at with Elijah Mitchell and kind of hang our hat on and say this is how he's going to win in the NFL, but yet does have the talent and just the overall ability to produce in his opportunity. So, yeah, I think that he is going to be a late-round steal. Now, again, it's just really interesting to see how the NFL values him. That is going to dictate what his fantasy stock looks like. But I'm glad that you mentioned him here because he is someone that I wanted to talk about as well. Glad that you mentioned Elijah Mitchell. I'm going to finish it out here with... A guy who I put in the first round of our one QB rookie mock draft that we did a couple of episodes ago, and it was more so to say, like, I know this guy is not going to actually go in the first round of rookie mocks, but I think that he should. And the consensus thought on Dwayne Eskridge, wide receiver out of Western Michigan, is that he is a third round, fourth round rookie picks, uh, rookie pick in some places. Uh, I am a big, big fan of Dwayne yeah. Eskridge. Yeah. 
there the popular comp out here is that I've been seeing is uh, is Will Fuller. I think that he has that level of speed to be able to take the top off of a defense. He's also excellent after the catch where you can get in the ball in space and then just let him pick up chunk gains. Good route runner, but here's the thing that really, really impressed me with Eskridge is his release at the line of scrimmage. Every single snap, he is fighting to create separation, and he's doing this and succeeding every single snap like he is able to just create separation constant fighting with his hands to be able to keep defenders keep his frame clean and then accelerate he has the acceleration and burst because one of the things that you're watching when you're watching release at the line of scrimmage is okay you're able with the wide receiver some of these wide receivers they're able to create the separation they're able to get the defender on their heels or they're able to fight them off with their hand create that space but then do they have the acceleration and burst to take advantage of it? And some of these guys, like example, Jonathan Adams Jr., I like. I think that he can win in a different way than what I talked about earlier. He has good burst for his size, but it's not going to be enough where he takes advantage of NFL caliber defenders getting on their heels and then accelerating and getting the inside leverage and positioning to be able to then you know, uh, set up his next break or whatever. Eskridge has that. Eskridge has the ability to be able to create that separation, and then it opens up so many different options for him. So really, really excited for him. I am I think that when it's all said and done, he's going to be a second-round NFL draft pick. I think the NFL is going to fall in love with this guy. We're going to start to see a lot of hype around him as we move towards the NFL draft. I just want to get him onto everyone's radar right now because I think that he is completely undervalued, and I'm really, really excited to see where he lands. So I've got to say this, Yates, and, and I'm coming to your defense here, brother. I'm coming to your defense because I know a lot of people saw that. We're like, oh, my God, it's crazy. What's wrong with Kyle? But the more that time has gone on, I listen to other podcasts and I'm reading things. I don't think it's as crazy as people make it seem, okay? Because while I do believe he's going to be probably – he's not falling out of the second round. You could bet that. Like, I, I'll bet the house on that. I think he's got a I think there is a chance, a chance that an NFL team in the back of the first round takes a shot on him, okay? Like and yeah. if that happens, if he gets first round draft capital, early second round draft capital, I'll say he's going to be closer to the 112 than he is the 312. Put it that way. I, I don't think there's right. a, a player with that speed and that draft capital and Listen, I, I know he was in college for about 10 years. That's my only knock. He, he's been in college a long time, <laughs> right? But with that draft capital and his production, his two-way ability, I talk about the dynamism a lot. I want those players that can return kicks, return punts. Well, that's Estridge. I, I, I believe he's one of the nation's leaders in all-purpose yards as well. But, uh, again, I, I just, I'm coming to your defense here because I, I've heard quite a few people on different platforms, on different networks, Pick him really, really high. Maybe like right around the, the 202, 203. So again, I do believe when it's all said and done, he's going to be closer to the 112 than he is the 312. And you can quote me on that, screen record this, whatever you want. But I, I do believe that's, I don't think you're as far off as people want to to make that seem, man, to be honest with you. Yeah, I'm a big, big fan of his game, and I think that he's going to make an impact right yeah. away. Uh, all right, so my top uh, or my five sleepers, just to go back through those, Jalen Darden, wide receiver out of North Texas, Jonathan Adams Jr., wide receiver out of Arkansas State, Larry Roundtree the third, running back out of Missouri, Ramondre Stevenson, running back out of Oklahoma, and then Dwayne Eskridge, wide receiver, Western Michigan. Ray, you want to run through your five? Yeah, my five, Jalen Darden out of North Texas, Kenny Yaboa from Ole Miss, Nico Collins at three from Michigan, two, Anthony Schwartz out of Auburn, and number one, Elijah Mitchell from Louisiana, the Raging Cajuns. All right. Well, that does it for our 2021 rookie sleepers conversation. Let's move into a listener mailbag again. You guys can submit your questions when we put out a post over on Twitter. That's why you should be following us. Twitter.com, of course, Ray GQ, QUE, and Kyle Y NFL. We got a couple of questions here. Or not, not a couple. We got more than a couple that we're going to try to get through here before the end of this episode. So Aggie Bass 85 on Twitter. Maybe too early for this one, but top 10 dart throws. Who, rookie-wise and or vet, are you willing to throw a dart at and hope that they come out as a taxi slash deep bench deep bench stash? So, top 10? Uh, I'm not doing a top 10. I'm sorry. That's just way too much. Uh, we did a, we did a uh, Under the Radar Dynasty Buys yeah. episode a few back that you can go back and listen to because that's got some names on it that, uh, that are good dart throws in there. But 
Right, just off the top of your head, I, I mean, I've got one that I can talk about that I did mention in that Bi Dynasty Bias episode. As far as a dart throw, is there anyone that jumps to your mind as a Dynasty dart throw? Someone who are you just saying, I'm going to add them to the bottom of my bench and just let's just see what happens. Dynasty, right? Not rookie draft, just Dynasty dart throw? Just Dynasty in general, yep. Tight end Donald Parham from the Los Angeles Chargers. If, there you go. If they there let Hunter Henry walk... Parham is in line. Now, they could very well draft the tight end in the draft, but dart throw, Parham, costs you literally nothing. Nothing. It, nothing. Exactly. P Donald Parham is a dynasty dart throw for me. I love that call. That was I did not see that coming, but I love that call. X, he was XFL, right? He yeah. was <laughs> AAF, XF, something. AAF, some, I don't remember uh, which yeah, league it was, yeah. but yeah, I mean, <laughs> tremendous size, yeah. uh, and it, he did flash last year. He had, I think he had... One or two big plays mm -hmm. that, uh, yeah, if he gets that opportunity, could make a contribution there for uh, for Dynasty. For me, I talked about J.J. Taylor mm -hmm. running back out of uh, – Arizona was his college, and then he's now in New England. With James White heading towards free agency, I do think that J.J. Taylor is going to step into that receiving back workload, uh, you know, that role here in New England. Now, who the quarterback is and what the offense looks like, that'll – of course will dictate his overall dynasty outlook but again we're talking about a dart throw someone that you can pick up everywhere in dynasty leagues so jj taylor running back really really impressed he's a receiving back kind of reminding me of Tariq cohen coming out mm -hmm. that's kind of his frame too he's a smaller back but tremendous hands i think can make an impact when he gets that opportunity so uh andrew erickson of course andrew erickson over at pff asks what's the move on henry ruggs do we hold out for a bounce back or get out now before his value hits rock bottom? You want to answer this one first? Yeah, I think you have to hold. Um, and, and and I give all these rookie wide receivers, the ones who did not do well year one, I give them a little bit of grace because of the season, right? And everything with the off season. My, my thing with moving Henry Ruggs now is you would truly be selling at rock bottom. I, I don't know what right. you can trade him for at all. So he's still a first round pick. He can stretch the field. Uh, you, you hold Henry Ruggs. You don't trade him right now because your 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 return on that is going to be so bad. You're not even going to want to take the deal. I, would you even give? Do you think you can get a second for him right now? Because I don't no. think so. I don't no. think so. So you, you're not accepting a third round pick for Henry Ruggs. You got to hold him. Yeah, I'm actually looking to acquire Ruggs where I can. I think that the past couple of classes and the guys who have made an impact right away have kind of spoiled and just kind of like have warped our perception of rookie wide receivers and the impact that they're supposed to make. You remember like a few years ago, everyone was saying like, hey, rookie wide receivers, they take a couple <laughs> years to acclimate, right? Like, no, well, now we've got guys like Justin Jefferson and CeeDee yes. Lamb and, you know, and making highlight reel catches and stuff like that. There was one year yeah. of Henry Ruggs in this offense that, I mean, the offense is not fantastic. It yeah. runs through Josh Jacobs, Darren Waller's there, of course. And then John Gruden just does not want to use Henry Ruggs in the way that he should be used. So there are some questions, right? Like I, there are definitely things that have to progress and change in order for Ruggs to hit his true ceiling because the talent is there. I mean, I had Ruggs as my number two wide receiver coming out last year for a reason. Like, he is just an absolute stud. So I think the talent is still there. He's someone that I'm willing to wait a little bit here on. And again, even acquire because, again, you can get him super, super cheap. I think you can get him as a third round, maybe even fourth round pick yep. in some cases. As like that throw in, we talk about it all the time, that throw in option on a you know bigger trade or something like that yep. if you can get rugs i i love making that move because i am willing to hold at least another year here to see okay what does it look like when we reevaluate and answer this question next year yep. uh at harvey 100 i have the 104 the wide receivers and the running backs in that range are dominant but i am not good at quarterback at all would you give up that talent and take a quarterback for the team so I guess I'll just answer this really quick. Like at that point, you do not sacrifice that value at the 104 to reach on a quarterback, especially if this is a one quarterback league. Like that wasn't specified, but I'm assuming that that's a one quarterback league. So at that point, Trevor Lawrence probably isn't going to go off the board until the 108, 109 in your casual leagues. And then you still have guys like Trey Lance, Justin Fields, like all these guys that can make an impact for you. Trade down. Like, get out of that pick or hold that pick hostage and get a proven veteran, right, at the running back position uh, or uh, or a proven quarterback, right? Like, I think you can, if your league overvalues the position, then go trade that for a proven 
veteran quarterback or trade down or something like that. But don't stay there at the 104 and take the quarterback. I think that that would just be sacrificing and reaching, uh, sacrificing on value and reaching just a little bit. So, Ray, do you have anything else yeah. that's different than that? You want? No, you you hit the nail. You don't do that. If this is a single quarterback league and you are in need of a quarterback, then you trade back. But you definitely do not in a single quarterback league take any quarterback at the 104 spot, especially when you could probably get a Trey Lance at the end of the second, a Justin Fields mids, like, no, 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 no. Somebody will trade you, move back, acquire picks, get a quarterback later. Don't do that. Yeah, especially because you do have other teams that are sitting there and saying, I need a running back. And there's going to be some guys that are at the 104, so then they're willing to pay up and move up. You can just switch that, you know, switch those picks, take the extra draft capital and rebuild your roster. Uh, At B-Ball Club on Twitter, out of Brian Edwards, KJ Hamler, and Jacoby Myers, which one are you cutting bait on? This one's actually pretty easy for me, but I want to hear what Mm. you think. Oh, it's easy for you, which means I'm going to pick the guy that you probably would cut and or wouldn't cut. And I, I'm letting go of um, I'm letting go of KJ Hamler, to be honest with you. He, he'd he be the one I would cut bait on. New England, it, when have they seen a commitment to add pass catching weapons? I don't know. Uh, and Jacoby Myers was arguably the best pass catching weapon that they had last year. Hamler now has to compete with Jerry Judy, a healthy Cortland Sutton. We don't know who's throwing him the ball. And for me, he's just an undersized wide receiver that uh, I, I'm keeping Brian Edwards and I'm keeping Jacoby Myers on, on this one. Uh, for me, I'm cutting Jacoby Myers. Yep. I'm keeping KJ Hamler and Brian Edwards. So with Myers, I think you mentioned it like with New England. When was the last time? Well, they didn't have a wide receiver need as drastic as what they have this year. And they're sitting towards the top of the league in terms of available cap space. We talked about some of the free agent wide receivers that are upcoming here with our free agency outlook episode that we did a couple uh, last week. They have the potential to just either sign one or two, one or two of these guys because the rest of the league does not have this cap space in hand, right? They do not have that cash to be able to spend and bring in some of these talented guys with, I mean, Corey Davis could be a guy that they bring in. I mean, you could even double down and add in a a proven veteran of a T.Y. Hilton and then look at the draft and they add in a a Jalen Darden in the fourth round or whatever. Like, I think that they have the potential to do that. And at that point, Jacoby Myers, who was an undrafted free agent, yes, he performed well in his opportunity, but his opportunity was because there was literally no one else on that roster that had any sort of talent. So I think Myers was a product of his opportunity rather than a, an overall talent that I think is worth betting on. KJ Hamler, big, big fan of love the speed element to his game. Think he's a well-rounded receiver in his own right. I think that he can, if Denver upgrades at the quarterback position, Hamler should be fantasy viable. And then Brian Edwards has the talent. I'm not quitting yeah. him just yet. So let me ask uh, you this, at this point, let me, let me ask you this, Nikhil Harry or Jacoby Myers. Who, which one do you Myers which one? and Myers in that point? Yeah, I, I'm just you know, I'm just as I'm thinking through it, like I, I can't knock you, like I, I, I agree with you with Hamler. I, what free agent wants to come to New England? Like, who, unless it's just about the money, right. the, who's throwing on the ball? Cam Newton, Jared Stidham. I just it, it might be bad for New England for a while. I think that's the overall sentiment. Like, do we want any of the pass catchers there, really? <laughs> Right, right. And at that point, I mean, no, I don't want Myers, but <laughs> you know, if that's the the option, then I'll take him. But what compared to Brian Edwards yeah. and KJ Hamler, yeah. I'll let I'll let Myers walk. Uh this one's really interesting, right? And I'm really interested to see to hear your thoughts. At Anderson ninety nine NHL, rebuilding team in a super flex league, okay? Okay. Does he sell Mahomes and Tyreek High or try to build around them? And then he provide they provide a little bit more context to the roster. The other other quarterbacks are Jimmy Garoppolo and Drew Locke, so kind of gross. Also own Cortland Sutton and two first round picks in 2021, plus two first round picks in 2022. And then they put in quotations the rest of the roster, or parentheses the rest of the roster can more or less be ignored. Okay, so you need to re you, they essentially need to rebuild this roster in a big big way so it all comes down to do you actually if you're a rebuilding team in a super flex league do you actually look to sell patrick mahomes because you're going to be able to get a king's ransom for him and the same with tyreek hill even at his you know he's getting up there in yeah. age and stuff like this he's still going to be a very very productive wide receiver for the foreseeable future so do you actually look to sell patrick mahomes and tyreek hill 
The short answer is you look to sell anybody given the right price. The problem is, and this is what I love about Dynasty, it's the game theory aspect. If his roster is pretty much more or less can be ignored, if I know that's all you really have, and I know you're you're if you're thinking you're desperate to move him, I'm not gonna give you an arm and a leg. Like I'm I'm just not, because your roster probably, even with Mahomes and Tyreek, probably isn't good enough to win it. And you're not going to be that bad with them. You're going to be decent as far as your end of season finish. So uh, to sell those two, I'm thinking about what I would even accept. Patrick Mahomes, I would want at least three first round picks. And that was what I had in mind too. Just for Mahomes. And if I'm selling Mahomes and Hill to the same dynasty manager, that stack is even more valuable. So I'm thinking if we're just talking strictly picks, Yates, uh, and I don't want to, I don't want to m- confuse sure. it with players. I'd need at minimum five first round picks at, at yep. before I could even even start taking this seriously. And I'm not talking about the 112 and the 111. I'd want 101, 102, 103. Uh, so, but I don't think Mahomes and Tyreek is is bad to build around. But if I were going to move one of them, it would be Tyreek Hill, not Patrick Mahomes. But I, I'm I would need at minimum three high first round picks to even consider trading Patrick Mahomes. It's crazy. The five first round picks was exactly what I had in mind too. So I think that's a absolute haul. I think that I'm fine selling Tyreek Hill at this point yeah. because the end for him will come sooner than it will for Patrick Mahomes, yep. obviously. So I think with Mahomes, I'm still willing to build my Superflex team around him yep. rather than you know, the combination of the two and try to sell him away and then try to fi- eventually find a Patrick Mahomes again in the draft, which it probably just isn't going to happen. So <laughs> if I can get Tyreek Hill, I can sell him for two first round picks, one this year, next year, whatever. Then that at least I have three first round picks this year to build around and add some talent. And then I'm entering into a long term rebuild, right? And just adding the talent and trying to make some savvy moves as I go along. So yeah, I'm fine with that. I don't think that you have to sell both of them. If I'm looking to sell one of them, I am looking to sell Tyreek, yep. though. At uh, Jack Rose underscore 12, who is a safer pick at the 109 and who has a higher ceiling between Rashad Bateman, wide receiver out of Minnesota, Rondale Moore, wide receiver out of Purdue, and Terrace Marshall, wide receiver out of LSU? So who is the safer pick at that spot and who has the higher ceiling out of those three? Uh, I think the safer pick is undoubtedly Rashad Bateman. And... I'd argue that his ceiling is probably just as high as the player that I would say, Rondell Moore. Um, but uh, I think Rondell Moore's ceiling is incredibly high because of the versatility that he brings to the game, what he can do. You know, he, he's one of those players, you know, we see Robert Woods catch 80, 90 passes a season and then give you 25 carries, which that that's added value. Rondell Moore can right. easily do that and probably score you a punt return touchdown for in a, in a game here or two in a season. But Rashad Bateman, I think when you're talking about a prospect with, if you're just saying, where are the red flags? I don't see much of any at all. I think he's incredibly safe with a very high ceiling. And I like Terrace Marshall as well. But if I had to say who's the safer pick at 109, Rashad Bateman, because we know exactly how he could be used at the NFL inside, outside Rondell Moore is going to be a slot receiver. Terrace Marshall, you know, we just haven't seen him be the guy for consistent for a extended period of time. So I think Rashad Bateman is the safer pick. Ceiling is probably a tie for me between Bateman and Rondell. Yep, that's exactly what I was going to say. Bateman is the safer pick. I think that he has an extremely high ceiling in his own right, but yet the ceiling for Rondale Moore is just ridiculous. Now, as far as I really don't see Terrace Marshall having the ceiling and impact. Yeah. That landing spot could change that, but as far as like the overall ceiling, I just don't see it with Terrace Marshall to that level. Uh, I think that he's got a lot of refinement that he has to work on to get to the at the next level. Uh, an extremely low floor. I don't know exactly where you feel on uh, what your feelings are on Marshall, but I just feel like he is a very boom bust pick. Yeah, uh, I'm with you on that. I, I don't think he's. Like Rashad Bateman, I think regardless of where he lands, Yates, he's going to be a good wide receiver, period. I don't, I can't say right. the same thing about Marshall. I think depending on where he lands, he could be a really good wide receiver or a really bad wide receiver as well. 
Yep, same here. Yep. Uh, Graham on Twitter. I've been offered the 105 plus the 312 and 401 uh, for Michael Thomas. Now, we talked about Michael Thomas on the last episode as far as sell now before it's too late. So given your views on MT as a guy to sell, would you be taking this offer? Feels risky when I'm not in rebuild mode. I'd be going wide receiver with a pick, and Chase will probably be gone. Jamar Chase will probably be gone by the 105 in a 12-team full PPR. So essentially, looking to make the trade of a 105 for Michael Thomas, who is the guy that you'd be taking there at the 105? You probably have Devontae Smith, Jalen Waddell, and Rashad Bateman all on the table. Is that worth it for you to make that trade of Michael Thomas? No, and we talked about this. Yeah, I'm I'm one who will move Michael Thomas, but not for the 105. Like I've and we talked about it. His name alone should fetch you a little bit more than that. If you're telling me I can get the 105 and the 205, now we can talk. But the 105 and then the 312, the 312 and the 401 do absolutely nothing for me. No, nothing. And if Chase is gone, if you know. Y- y- Michael Thomas or Devontae Smith or Michael Thomas and Rashad Bateman is what you're looking at. And as much as I love both of those players, you're praying that they turn into Michael Thomas. So just for the 105, right. uh, you can get more. So I would not make that deal. Yeah, uh, same here for me. I think you can get a little bit more. I think it's close. I don't think you're going to be able to get much, much more, especially with MT coming off the season that he did. But I would personally be looking to get just a little bit more there for Michael Thomas. Mm -hmm. Uh, At the Dayman 41, this is my first time doing a dynasty league. I have the last pick in a 12-team league for the startup draft. Also means that I have the first pick in the rookie draft. So you get to select, you know, you're doing that selection. Mm -hmm. You get the last pick in the startup draft, and then you get to choose where you're drafted in the the, uh, rookie pick. Knowing I can have Trevor Lawrence for his career, do I go big with my startup draft and try to win now? or play safe. So this is a really interesting overall philosophy question, and I'll throw it to you first. What do you think you should do here? If you do have that rookie pick, that 101, where you know that that can turn into Trevor Lawrence, does that mean that you are just going all out, you're taking the proven veterans and you're, you know, punting, you know, we talked about the, uh, what was it, the productive struggle yep. approach. Like we talked about that, like, are you going to go that route or are you going to try to get the value where it falls and get those proven veterans. See, I think the the beauty of startups and the beauty of dynasty leagues are a you can let the board fall to you and b you can have so much fun. So if you just want to load up on young players, I guarantee you'll have an opportunity to do that. If it's super flex, I bet you Joe Burrow sitting there at the 112. You can go Burrow and Lawrence and now you are loaded at QB for the foreseeable future. If it's single yeah. quarterback, there are going to be some great picks. There could be a De- uh, Jonathan, you know, the DeAndre Swift waiting on you, a Justin Jefferson waiting for you. So, uh, if this were my team, I would go young, high upside, and build a young roster that may not compete and win this year, but by next season, I could have an absolute juggernaut on my hands. But this is the beauty of it. Like, what do you want to do? I mean, you you are going to be open right. for business either direction. Yeah, I'm going to take more of a balanced approach, and that really is kind of the strategy that I deploy across the board in my startup drafts is really I'm just going to look for the value. If a veteran running back is sitting there who's really talented, is a proven guy that you know falls to me, then I'm going to take him there. If I'm looking at the board and I don't really like any of the proven veterans, but there's a young, intriguing you know, wide receiver who I am a big fan of, then I'll take him there. Right? Uh, I'm going to take the guys where... Uh, where the board falls and where it lands and stuff like that. So, yeah, but again, Ray mentioned it. Like, just have fun. Like, do what you want to do. What do you want to do? Do you want to go into next season with Trevor Lawrence and then, you know, the guys and just go purely a 2020 and 2021 yep. <laughs> draft <Yep>. and, <laughs> uh, you know, rebuilding roster? Then do that. You're going to be great in a year or two. Uh, if you want to go with Lawrence and the proven veterans, then do that too. You're going to be productive as well. So uh, at JD Newman too, you said on Monday for this. So this is more for me and on uh, referencing our last show. Uh, you think Russ is 95% out of Seattle. If so, what are you doing with DK Metcalf? Are you trading or holding? I am going to look to trade DK Metcalf if I can, because I think that I can get a King's ransom for him. And I think that if Russell Wilson is indeed out of Seattle, and I think that is going to happen sooner rather than later, then at that point, who's going to be playing quarterback? Now, I think Metcalf has the talent to absolutely just, you know, supersede the situation. It'll still be relevant. But if I can trade Metcalf right now for a King's Ransom, I'm probably going to do that. But 
the issue now becomes do i have the does the dk metcalf manager in my league know that russell wilson might leave right like is it are they going to be or i'm sorry the person trading for dk metcalf are they going to know that you know russell wilson might leave and at that point are they going to be hesitant to try to make that trade are they going to be hesitant to give up the pure or the most value right the most worth here for dk metcalf that's the only question so if i can turn him for a couple of first round picks or a first a high high first round pick i might do that what do you think yeah, this one is, is really tough because it seems like just a couple of months ago, the consensus was DK Metcalf was wide receiver one in Dynasty. And right. uh, honestly, without Russell Wilson even being traded, I, I don't think he's even top three anymore. Just change. I think people would take Justin Jefferson. I still think Tyreek Hill or Devontae. I, I just, if Russ leaves, this is not good for DK Metcalf. And I don't know how quarterback independent he is like just it doesn't matter who's back there you just throw it at DK you would like to right. think so but it just seems like that it seems like everything is unra- everything is unraveled with the Seahawks since they threw the interception versus New England like five years ago in that Super Bowl and whenever it was um, right. I would definitely be looking to move DK but I, I would need if we were talking Tyreek Hill, we probably needed two first for DK. I know this sounds crazy, but Dynasty, I need two first and a player, and I mean, and a, and a decent yeah. player at that. You know, three first might be pushing it, but I need two first and some sort of younger player to add to that in order for me to even consider moving DK. Same here, man. Yeah, I think that if you can capitalize on that value, I'm pulling the trigger just because of the percentage chances, right? I talk about that all the time. Like, what are the percentage chances that Russ stays in Seattle? Well, I talked about it with, I think it's 95% that he's gone. Okay, well then at that point, I'm gonna pull the trigger based on that probability and the probability that Seattle goes into next season with a very run heavy approach and not Russell Wilson behind center, which is a huge part of what makes up the value of DK Metcalf and makes him so valuable for fantasy football. He's only 23 still. He's it's still crazy, 23 man. years old. Man. He's super, super young. So, yeah, I get – I mean, you talked about him being ranked as a wide receiver one in Dynasty. I totally get it. Like, I, I get it. He's super young and extremely talented, tied to a phenomenal quarterback. Well, now he might not yep. be tied to that phenomenal quarterback long term. So, that definitely puts just this kind of cloud over DK Metcalf and his Dynasty stock. So, if you can get the true value, if you can sell him, I'm doing it. Yeah. I think that I'll pull the trigger on that. All right, man, that is going to do it for today. Again, thank you so much to Reality Sports Online for sponsoring the show. Head over to realitysportsonline.com to learn more about their amazing product. Ray, we had the rookie sleepers. We had the listener mailbag. It was a great show. Yeah. Anything else to get off your chest before we get out of here? No, nah, man, it was a great show. Dak Prescott is signed for the next four I was about to say years. you learned about Dak Prescott. Let's <laughs> go, Cowboys. I might go, put, I might go put some money on us winning the Super Bowl this year. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Well, hey, uh, for Ray Garvin, I'm Kyle Yates, and we'll see you next time. Looking for useful content, fantasy-relevant information, and the data that can help your team win? Then make sure to subscribe to the Fantasy Pros YouTube channel. And while you're at it, Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Fantasy Pros so we can help you dominate your league all season long.